Here, please uh, remember to silence your phones, and if you are sitting at the end of a row, please scooch in a little bit, especially if you're in the back there near the entrance, so that late arrivals uh, are minimally disruptive. Uh, so, just a heads up before I introduce our wonderful speaker here, we are going to have some time for Q&A at the end, so please hold your questions, write them down, whatever is good for you, and uh, we will take them, or as many of them as we can at the end. So, with that said, I would like to introduce Ricky Inslee, Community Manager and Editor at OpenSource.com, and uh, she is going to be presenting on the proper care and feeding of communities and carnivorous plants. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you for that introduction, and um, uh, I want to thank the organizers for having me. It's been an awesome week, and um, I've loved Hobart, and then, of course, the event's great. Um, the, this talk was inspired by Deb Nicholson. A lot of you probably know her. Um, she followed along with my carnivorous plant saga online, as I would occasionally tweet or post on Facebook these ex this experience I was having with carnivorous plants. And then um, she jokingly said, I'll give you bonus points if you put a picture of your plant into one of your talks. And I was like, challenge accepted. I'll do a whole talk about my plants. And so that's what led to this. Um, but you don't, uh, don't feel like you have to take notes about plants or whatever, because I also wrote this up as an article on our website. Um, and so the points I will cover in, in this talk are also included in this article, Nine Rules for the Proper Care and Feeding of Communities and Carnivorous Plants on opensource.com. So um, about the Venus flytrap, I did not know these details until after I already uh, started on this journey, but the Venus flytrap is the official state carnivorous plant of North Carolina, where I currently live on the east coast of the United States. Um, I don't think all states have official state carnivorous plants, but we do. And uh, there are only a few hundred carnivorous plants on Earth, and six of those are native to the United States. One is the Venus flytrap, and it grows along the North Carolina coastline within about a 75-mile radius of Wilmington, which is a, a beach community. I actually uh, went and saw them growing in person in the wild. It's kind of cool, and they grow some pitcher plants and um, just in this little swampy area that anyone can walk to. And uh, only about 35,000 are currently growing in their natural habitat along the coastline. I got mine at the grocery store. Um, I walked in uh, to the Whole Foods one morning, and you know, uh, it's on the way to the produce aisle. There's a couple plants, and I was like, ooh, a Venus flytrap. And I was very excited to get this flytrap. And I also bought a pitcher plant, which um, is to the left. They grow together uh, uh, in the wild. And um, I will only focus on one of my plants in this talk. You're welcome. <laughs> and then that's my cat, Maggie. She's a 16-year-old cat, and she's always in everybody's business. So the second I put them on the table, she was all up in there in their leaves. And uh, my Venus flytrap is named Gordon. Uh, if you ever saw WKRP in Cincinnati, I, I put the naming of my plants out onto social media, which is not a good idea. Uh, I think we learned from Bodie McBoatface that was a bad idea. Uh, but so my friends named Gordon, and um, then uh, Banana Rama is my pitcher plant. I think that was actually a name nominated for Gordon, and I misunderstood. And anyway, so my pitcher plant is named Banana Rama. So lesson one, prepare before diving in. I learned this the hard way. I should have researched carnivorous plants before buying a couple in the flower aisle on the way to the produce section of the grocery store, um, but I didn't. And I hadn't considered how plants have uh, different needs and requirements. And uh, I'm known for not having a green, th green thumb anyway. Uh, I, people think I'm good with succulents, but it's because I keep replacing succulents in the same pots and people don't know I killed them and I just got new ones. And, um, and I've killed air plants, and all they need is air. So I'm not really good with plants, but I was real excited to get these. Um, but as with communities, before you um, join a community or start contributing, um, and certainly before you start trying to run the show and tell people what to do in a community, it's better off if you've done a little bit of research on the community and you know more about their history and um, the traditions, you know, and the culture of um, any kind of a community and the etiquette. Uh, for contributing or for communicating in a community. But uh, luckily, I did do research on carnivorous plants after I got mine home. 
which was um, where this started getting complicated for me because um, I thought, oh, this is great, I'll just water them. But you can't just water them, they need rainwater or distilled water. Um, and so it is a good thing that I, had, I did a little bit of research because they also, you can't just pour water on top of them, they soak them up from the bottom um, through holes in the bottom of their pots. Um, so uh, I did not kill them by dumping you know, our toxic drinking water on top of them. <laughs> Um, another thing is, uh, uh, a sunny spot is just is not enough. Uh, healthy environments must be maintained for plants and communities. Um, this is a mistake that you see sometimes with uh, communities. Uh, for example, if an organization releases a, a project as open source, or any, if somebody launches a project, you know, and says, "Hey, here's my project." It's rare that a community just gathers around and the project takes off and everything's fine. Um, you know that that sunny spot, the creation, you know, leaving it alone is not is not going to be enough. Um, communities uh, can gather around a common interest, but uh, they uh, still will thrive um, if they have they need to have like a set um, uh, goals, you know, or um, an outcome, you know, or uh, something that they have in common that they're all working towards and uh, standards for communicating. They have to be able to communicate. They need some kind of an organization. Um, some kind of recognition or reward system is usually uh, you know, helpful for building a community. And uh, neglected communities we've seen historically in open source um, and you know, out, outside of open source um, don't tend to thrive longer term. Um, that's why we have government, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, but so uh, with communities or with plants, um, you, uh, there's a level of communication going on between leaders and um, or plant caretakers, gardeners, or whatever. And um, so it requires some observing um, in addition to listening for feedback. Some of it is actually observing. Some people aren't saying, you know, like plants can't tell me exactly what they need. I have to see the signs and kind of watch for changes and that sort of thing, and that happens with communities also. Uh, lesson three, I learned with my plants, and I've seen this also with communities, if it's not broken, you might not need to fix it. Um, Community-wise, I, I think of uh, linuxquestions.org. Um, if you look at the site, I don't know that it's ever changed since the beginning. It, uh, Jeremy Garcia, the founder of linuxquestions.org, is one of our community moderators and writers on opensource.com. And uh, uh, he wrote an article for us about the history of Linux questions uh, late last year. And I said, hey, can you send in your original logo and show me what it looked like and, and then you know your most recent one? And, and uh, let me see how much it's changed. And, and um, he, sent, he sent it in, and I was like, did, I, did you send in the original too? They actually aren't dramatically different. Uh, and then I don't know that the website has ever changed. But he's got a really thriving, healthy community, and it's a super functional site. It's a huge community, and people get what they need out of it. So I don't, I don't know that I would recommend you go in and do a redesign on the site, you know, or add a bunch of bells and whistles. It's working right now, so uh, that's his call. So, meanwhile, Gordon and Bananarama were thriving in my kitchen, and I was feeling really cool because I had these uh, carnivorous plants, and um, I'd be home on a Friday night, and I'd see a bug in my house, and I'd be really excited and try to catch a little spider or something, because I really wanted to see them, you know, see it eat a spider, and then I realized this is what my life has come to, is I'm trying to feed my plant on a Friday night, I want to give it a spider, you know, and um, anyway, they were doing great in their little plastic pots, and um, uh, I had this great idea that um, I could do better. They need a better. They need better pots. And so, um, I thought that they would. Um, uh, you know, they were happy enough in these, but I thought they'll be happier in um, pots that I could sit in, like a little that comes with a little tray that is um, that just has water in it all the time. But, you know, and um, and they should be blue because I'll go with my kitchen. And um, uh, so. Um, I, I like to think that they were they had IRC and then um, I decided they needed Slack and everything was fine um, <laughs> uh, and that so I introduced Slack so in doing so I created new problems um, so meet mouse that's the third one so the plant the planter I got came only with three and it looked weird to me to just have two and so I got a third plant and I named it mouse has anyone read if you give a mouse a cookie it's a children's book. Well, the story is, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to need a glass of milk to go with it, you know, and then he's going to need a nap, and he's going to need, yeah, and it just goes on and on, all these things you have to do once you give a mouse a cookie, and that's why he got named Mouse, 
was because this was turning into a much bigger production, this impulse purchase at the grocery store. Um, so yeah, that's how I end up with Mouse. And I won't go into much more detail about Mouse. He's not key to this. Um, so, um, like communities, I discovered that carnivorous plants are um, unpredictable about adapting to change. And I, you know, but I'm not a rookie when it comes to uh, communities. I'm not great with plants, but I'm working on it. And so I um, thought I, I knew I had to be really careful about this change, and I knew that there was going to be some special soil involved, um, and I had to get the mix just right so I wouldn't cause damage. And the same is true when you're introducing change to community. Uh, if you just go in and, and are like, hey, here, here's the new tool, this is what we're doing now, um, I guarantee your community is going to be very upset that they weren't part of this process, you know, and um, particularly if they're perfectly happy with everything they already have. Uh, and I think that's where IRC and Slack is a nice little example. You know, some communities are very excited about being part of, you know, using Slack, and um, some of them are IRC, is it over my dead body, will I ever get on Twitter? You know, so. Uh, I wouldn't force Twitter on anyone, <laughs> or Slack. Um, so if your community effectively collaborates over IRC, um, are you sure Slack is going to be an improvement for them? Um, or will it actually, uh, you know, uh, alienate some of your longer-term contributors, and maybe your goal is to attract new contributors, you know, um, are, are you willing to do that at, at the cost of losing uh, contributors? Or is it possible to add options without taking away any of the tools that you have that already work? So um, my, clients, my plants were doing great. Um, they continued to thrive. I was feeling really good because they were growing so fast. And, um, I, and uh, I, then I realized I, I had uh, totally dropped the ball. Because if you see um, Gordon in the middle there, he was down so far and he was growing, but then he's just growing up against his walls and I had I'd failed to plan for growth. And uh, I realized I was gonna have to move, remove some obstacles so that they could grow. And so at this point you can see why I'm thinking about communities here because things had gotten more complicated than I thought. It looked like it was gonna be fun and then it got challenging. <laughs> um, I was stepping on toes left and right over here. Um, so I was like, great, we'll upgrade. We'll, um, uh, we'll add some IRC channels. You know, what could go wrong? Let's have 10 channels. Uh, um, and then I had to order all the special, I couldn't find a place in town that had the dirt, perlite, whatever that is, which is toxic, and I had to wear a mask on my face. And um, yeah, so, and then there was uh, the thing they were supposed to sit in to water them leaked everywhere, and that didn't work. Uh, it was a nightmare. And this is, at this point is where I was like, this is like communities, I'm writing an article. <laughs> So, fourth lesson, plan for growth and adjust plans accordingly. Um, I didn't want to shock my plants by taking them out of the soil they were used to, and, um, but I knew that they needed more soil and, um, you know, so they could have bigger roots and whatever the plants do. And so I took the um, community equivalent approach of keeping IRC and introducing slack. Um, I kept the soil they were already in, and then I added more soil and perlite and hoped that I got the mix right and, um, and that I didn't ingest toxins. And I put them in a new window in my kitchen, um, and I was feeling really good about it. And that's a new window, and see, they had to go in different pots because the other thing was leaking. But um, So I made several changes at once, and um, the, all of a sudden I could tell the plants weren't doing well, and I didn't know what change I did that had impacted them. I didn't know what thing I did wrong, because I, I put them in a new window, they're in new pots, they're in new dirt, and so I didn't know what I did wrong. And um, I, if you're going to introduce change, I recommend doing one change at a time, if, because, and take metrics. You need metrics, because I, couldn't, I didn't know what I did wrong, and um, metrics matter, which is why I asked James Faulkner to write um, articles for us on opensource.com. Uh, I saw him give a talk uh, internally at Red Hat about uh, community metrics, and I thought it was a really great talk because he talked about avoiding vanity metrics. For example, on our site, uh, we will look at page views, how much traffic an article got. That's a vanity metric. It doesn't. It, it tells you that much. It tells you it got a, an article got a lot of page views. Um, but so you need to know why. Is it because it was um, the right topic and people really like that topic? If we if we do a Raspberry Pi article, for example, you know those always do well. People want to know about Raspberry Pi projects. 
Um, but some other topics, you know, maybe it'll get a whole bunch of page views. Is it because it got picked up on Hacker News or um, somebody else wrote about it and linked to it in another article? So uh, you have to be beware of vanity metrics. And um, he also ha he wrote in his series an article on how to measure health and with suggestions and then choosing the right metrics for your project. Uh, what is it? What's your goal in the project? And so you want metrics, but you want to measure the right thing. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and make one change at a time. Lesson learned with plants and communities. So uh, the other thing is, you know, when we're doing metrics, we look for anomalies. Um, you know, uh, and for, for example, if Facebook makes a change to their algorithms, um, you know, or Twitter or social media, that can totally change um, how people are finding out about articles on our site. And so if we see a drop off in traffic on our site, you know, that's where we're able to kind of check, you know, is it because we're not writing and publishing great articles anymore or is it something outside of our, our control? So lesson six, energy and enthusiasm ebbs and flows. Um, I moved my plants to different windows to see if they perk up, but I still couldn't be sure um, if it was something I did or didn't do uh, that was affecting their growth. Um, then I was thinking, could it be coincidental because of the season change, because it, we were starting to get into fall, and I was really hoping it wasn't me making the plants not do well. And um, so I did a little bit of research, and I discovered that uh, carnivorous plants go dormant in the winter, and so I was, I was like, yeah, I didn't kill my plants. Um, but uh, for community-wise, we noticed um, because we do metrics, we are able to see a trend and know that um, around October, it becomes harder for us to get articles in. Um, uh, people are less inclined to write for us October, November, December, and that makes sense, right? Because if you're um, celebrating holidays or if you're a student, um, these are times of year where um, you know there are big changes going on. You're um, taking time off, traveling that sort of thing, and because we have that metric, we can plan in advance for this kind of change. And um, uh, so if you're, if you're raising a plant, it, it helps to have that information too. Uh, sadly, that's not what was going on with my plants. Um, so I was really hoping that my plants were responding to fall and um, going dormant for winter. And then I, start, I saw that the leaves started to go brown. Um, see, leaving and leaves, I felt good about that. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about leaves. So um, people leaving a community and leaves browning on a plant, um, neither of those necessarily are bad signs. It's definitely something you want to look for. Um, for example, um, two of our community moderators, two of, um, of, you know, of our favorite humans, uh, left uh, our, our moderator program, opensource.com, last year. But this was actually a sign of success for us because both of them got hired at Red Hat to write documentation on different teams. And so this was a really good thing. This is a win for them, a win for us. They can still write for us. So this was healthy. This wasn't they left because, um, you know, that we had a toxic community. Um, you know, that would have been something that we would have uh, been much more concerned about. Um, and then with plants, you know, brown leaves can be age. They're just dropping off, you know, and making way for new plants. So I was like, okay, well, let's hope that's what's going on with my plants. They're getting brown leaves because they're getting new leaves. Um, so, but I, I thought maybe they're not getting enough light, whatever. I moved them to a different room, different window. Um, and uh, the other thing is to watch out for pests and burnout. And... Um, this applies to communities and to plants. Um, so I, I checked, I, I Googled again, and um, I checked for mold. I don't know what mold looks like on the leaf, but I didn't see it. And um, looked for bugs and whatever. I didn't see any of that. Um, I did notice that Maggie was drinking all their water um, when they were in the smaller um, bowls and or pots, and I did have to move them away from the table to a place where my cat couldn't get. So she would have been the pest in this situation. Um, and in communities, you know, um, there are, I won't name any communities specifically, um, but there definitely have been communities that have been harmed um, uh, and killed because of um, toxic personalities that were allowed to stay in the community. Trolls, you know, um, that, uh, and it used to, you don't see it as often now, and it's certainly not as acceptable now, uh, you know, where people will talk about free speech, whatever, and just let anybody say anything and um, not have standards. Um, uh, obviously, that's not going on at this event. This event has, you know, talked about the codes of conduct 
um, you know, and been very clear about that. Communities are adopting codes of conduct much more, um, and um, uh, having standards for you know what's acceptable because um, you know at the end, if you don't do that kind of gardening with the pests or trolls or whatever you end up with, you end up up with them instead of the people that are more pleasant and actually making you know nice contributions and helping you attract new people into your community. So um, what do you do about uh, you know, people or pests um, in your communities? There's no one easy answer. Uh, Jono Bacon is a well-known uh, community manager. I, I imagine uh, some of you here have heard of him or know him. He wrote uh, the book, The Art of Community, for O'Reilly uh, years ago. He's a community moderator on our site and writes a community column for us, and he writes for other publications and speaks at events. And he wrote this article, How to Fire Community Members, on our site um, as part of his column. And it's really hard to do that. Um, for uh, opensource.com, you know, for our moderators, luckily we, we don't fire moderators as a volunteer position. We have um, expectations for, um, you know, bare minimum requirements of what you need to do to stay in the program. But if you don't meet those requirements, it's usually because people got busy or whatever. They're not getting fired, but they can't stay in the program. You know, they can still write for us, but... Um, uh, uh, and then as far as the website goes, you know, we do moderate comments and all that, and so if you're jerky in comments, the comment gets deleted, and rarely would we have to ban anyone, but they're not members of our community. Um, uh, you know, other communities, uh, you know, he's had to fire multiple people, I'm sure, over the years, and other community managers are, were a little different being an online publication, but um, sometimes you have to do it. It's very unpleasant. I wouldn't tell you how to do it, but uh, he's got some good pointers in this article. I kept the cat. She was not. Uh, she <laughs> just moved the plant. Um, so he had he he had this nice quote. He said, um, "If through an empathetic, mentored, and considerate considerate approach, we identify that someone is just noise, is bringing down the motivation of the community, is an inhibitor to innovation, it's our responsibility as leaders to remove them. If we don't, we compromise the very fabric of what makes open source incredible: human relationships connected by a core mission and ethos, and underlined by the spirit and acknowledgement of doing." Okay, so now back to the brown leaves analogy. Um, so brown leaves can be a sign of a healthy plant that's merely shedding its leaves uh, to make way for new ones. And uh, just like in the community, people leaving community could be a sign of a healthy, vibrant community. They're moving on to different parts of the community. They got hired by a company. They got hired by a different company. They um, learned all they could you know, from you know, this project and they've decided to move on to another project. Um, that could be perfectly fine. you know. Um, but then it also can be a sign of there being problems when people are leaving. Um, for, and so one thing to be aware of is um, burnout. Um, also, with yourself, this is something that I've had to do over the years. I still continue to do it. Um, I, and at this point, I've been doing this long enough where I'm fairly good at starting to see my signs of burnout. If I start getting kind of uh, rude to people, uh, <laughs> if I'm getting short to people, I realize it's, it's me, it's not them, and that's when I think, okay, I need to take a three-day weekend, um, or uh, uh, I need to delegate some things, you know. Um, last year on our site, because I have been doing this for a while, I've, I've gotten pretty good at reading uh, writers. <laughs> that's kind of weird, but okay. Um, uh, what The pace that they're able to, uh, at which they're able to work, and one of our um, writers was uh, writing lots for us and great content and um, I thought it was really great and I but I noticed that he just he kept adding more and more and so um, I asked him if he wanted to have a quick phone call um, because we know each other also and so I talked to him and I said this is great and I don't want to discourage you and I love that you have all this enthusiasm and energy but I also am seeing red flags um, I think that maybe you're putting unreasonable expectations on yourself and you're not going to be able to keep up this pace and, um, and I'm seeing a little bit of signs of stress, you know, that you're taking out more than you can really do, and, it's, and you want to do all these things, but then when you're signed up for it, you're not enjoying them as much as you could be because you signed up for too much, you know, and he's like, God, I'm really glad that you said this because I've started feeling a little stressed out, you know, and he just needed to know that it was okay for him not to stay at the pace he had been doing, you know, he, he was feeling good about it for a while, and then he needed to have some time off. So he actually took some time off of writing, and he still writes for us now, you know, but he, he went ahead and took a break for a few weeks and um, 
And uh, you know, maybe we'll have to have that talk again later, but right now he's at a nice little study piece that he can manage. You know, but he had to hear, you know, you're still a great contributor to the community. If, if you take time off and take care of yourself, that's also totally fine. Um, number nine, this is a very important lesson. You can't take care of a community um, or carnivorous plant alone. Okay, well maybe you can with a plant, I don't know, I can't, but um, with a community, <laughs> you really can't with a community. A community is a community. Um, that means that uh, it, it, you know, it's not just one person running the show. There are some communities that are like that, I guess, but um, not many, and um, uh, they're not generally healthy, happy communities and not traditionally open source communities. So if you're charged with caring for a community or carnivorous plant, um, you'll need some help. You need some kind of a, a system, either officially or unofficially, some people who um, are helping, um, you know, different parts of it. Um, um, I've, I haven't met any really effective community uh, leaders who take care of community um, all on their own. Generally, they're very good at helping other people get up to speed on um, taking over leadership because eventually, um, you're going to roll off into other projects too, and you want your community to thrive and survive. And so you're going to want other people who are competent on um, keeping the culture going and uh, keeping it healthy. Uh, on our site, for example, on opensource.com, um, we have a small team of editors. Uh, uh, Jen, who helps get our content in and work with um, most of our writers and um, edit and um, schedule content, and then Jason Baker specializes in SEO and OpenStack and, and um, some of our technical editing, and then uh, Alex does a lot of our social media, um, most of our social media, and then he keeps an eye on what um, people are commenting you know, on Twitter and Facebook and G+, because I don't have time to go read all that all the time, and so he can tell us what people are saying and if we need to respond, or he can respond to them so that um, we're covering all the different areas of our community um, as a group. And then we also have this wonderful set of moderators. Um, these are volunteer positions, people um, from all over the world um, who have uh, different areas of expertise and different things they're interested in on the site. We have a new one um, I haven't put on here yet, Nithya Ruff um, just joined us recently also. And, um, uh, and it's great because they, you know, they uh, make sure we have a nice diversity in our content on the site and um, in the voices that we get on the site. And they help us find new writers. They um, help us uh, find uh, projects that we haven't heard about or get updates on projects. And, um, and uh, we could not do it without our community moderators. And then, of course, we have our regular writers also um, who contribute and uh, give us feedback on the site. Okay, so I gave this talk for the first time in November, I think, and at that time I hadn't broken down yet and take, taken in my plant <laughs> to a garden center. Um, so not long after that I got home and I was looking really close at Gordon and he's just, he looks so bad. I didn't put pictures in here because I'm embarrassed about how bad he looks because I named him and so I'm attached to this plant now, right? And um, I looked and I thought I saw some little gnats on him and uh, I was working home that day and I was like, emergency, emergency, you know, and I told my team, I'm, I'm going to lunch. I didn't say I'm taking my plant to the doctor, but I put my plant in the car and I went to the garden center and I took it in and I told the guy, I was like, yeah, so uh, I think my plant has bugs on it. And he was like, wow, that's the least of my concerns with this plant. <laughs> and uh, he was like, you're overwatering it and you gave it too big of a pot. And so I was drowning this thing apparently. I thought I was, I mean, it was sitting in water. It was sucking up however much it needed. I, apparently that's not how you do it. You let them dry out for a while. Um, I missed that Google page. Um, so I don't know what they look like right now. I left home at the beginning of December. I have, my pet sitter is there taking care of the pets and the plants, and I actually told him not to water any of the plants. I'm, so they may or may not be alive when I get home. To be continued. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you all an update next year. Um, yeah, so I broke down, took him to the garden center, and um, yeah, I, Drowning them. Um, what I learned, I'm good at many things, but caring for carnivorous plants is not one of them. Um, <laughs> I, not, uh, yeah, They're, I just feel bad because they, they seem more alive to me than other plants because they actually eat flies and stuff. And so I won't be getting any more of them. I'll go visit them in the wild. Um, and uh, yeah, no more. Um, here's the other thing. Um, Community management, they, um, people often say it's a soft skill. If people skills are soft skills. Um, if this were true, all communities would be happy, healthy, and thriving. Um, it's not a soft skill. It's actually very hard to um, take care of um, a community because you're not in charge. You're not the boss of people. You know, you're, you're really, you're gardening. You're trying to make sure that there's a thriving, healthy place for communities to 
happily get what they want out of this participation, you know, in this ecosystem. And so you're making sure you don't drown them, you know, and that they're in, you know, that they have the, the workspace, that they have the tools they need to get what they want out of it, that they can move on to new projects um, or to other uh, other things and hopefully leave on great terms, you know, and come back if they're ready and uh, or want to come back and that um, you get new people into the community and or new leaves. Um, so yeah, it's not a soft skill and I have lots of respect for um, community managers um, uh, and uh, community manager appreciation day is coming up in January, I believe. I think it's, is it the 23rd? Oh, it's Monday. Okay, good. So um, yay, happy. Uh, Community Manager Appreciation Day on Monday. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Jonah actually is posting an article, I think, on our site on Monday, uh, giving a shout out. So, uh, to learn more about carnivorous plants, this is what they look like. Uh, see the brown leaves. This is when, before they really took a turn for the worst. And yeah. But visit mycarnivore.com. Um, I can't help you with your carnivorous plants. Um, and to learn more about how to get involved with our community, you can go to our participate page. And um, it also has links to our social media. And that's all I've got. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So we have some time for questions. But before we do, I would like to present to you, on behalf of the organizers and papers committee, this gift. Oh, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So I see a question in the back. Thank you, great talk. So does every state have its own carnivorous plant? I don't think so, we might be the only one. I didn't know it was a thing. I was real excited when I found out that we had one though. I've only been in North Carolina a couple of years, so. I'm from Kansas and I don't think we even have carnivorous plants in Kansas. We, I know we have a, uh, a state, the box turtle is our state reptile in Kansas, so. <laughs> So uh, it might have been a little bit late, but I, I wondered if you had any thoughts about keeping people accountable in uh, open source communities uh, where people are not necessarily uh, forced to keep contributing like they would be in a professional environment? Um, well, I guess that's complicated. I guess it depends on um, what your community is like. Like in our community, I can use it as an example because we um, opensource.com, it's an online publication, but we also kind of run it like a community because it's a community um, contributed site. Um, and so we do have um, a published list on our site of the expectations to stay part of the program for open uh, for the community moderators. And um, then it's a friendly conversation, you know, that, um, if you're not meeting those goals at some point, then we say, well, you can stay part of the writing community, but you can't be in this program. For an open source project, um, unless they're, like, I, I think if you they were on a, your council or something, you would have similar expectations. But if they're just a member of your community, sometimes you want people who are, I mean, members of your community are just people using your software and telling you if they don't like something or asking for um, new features. Those, um, in many communities, those are also valued as, you know, contributions, so they're getting feedback, you know, and um, uh, reporting bugs or helping document. And so um, I think it would depend on what level they are in in your community. Is it a certain role they have? And if there are outlined expectations for that role, and then that's something I would think you would have formalized where it's public and on your site, you know, expectations and, um, yeah. Did they answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? All right. All right. So give her a round of applause, please. Okay. Thank you.